welcome to another episode of Go Horns and Fight Songs. I hope everything's working now. There's some tech issues. Should be on the road. Should be good. Hopefully. We'll figure it out in like a half hour when everything goes to hell and we have to start all over again. <laughs> but if you're seeing this, that means we didn't have to do that and we just suck at what we're doing. Um, but hey, you know what? It was the first weekend of college hockey. It was a fun and exciting weekend. I watched almost every game. How about you? I watched um I watched about three and two thirds ish games. Um I I was transferring uh my my Xbox external drive upstairs and I, I was having a few issues getting into my NCHC account to watch the UMD game uh on Sunday. But other than that, I watched uh Western and UMD. You know, those were probably the better games of the weekend, or could have been. Actually, surprisingly, the uh, Ferris Miami series was a pretty close contested series. Uh, I think we, I did have that one called being called a split, and depending depending on how you want to fight about it or argue about it, you could say it was a split. Ferris won the first game in a shootout. It'll go in the pairwise rankings or the uh, official standings as a tie. But, you know, I think fans generally count shootout wins and overtime wins as wins anyway. And Miami won game two in regulation. So you can argue about whether or not that's a full split or a tie and a, and a, and a win for Miami, whatever you want to do. I'm going to go with the fan opinion and say that I called that correctly as a split. I I would say so, too. And I, I do think that they should adjust it a little bit more to the... NHL style they're they're already adjusting the points for the pair pairwise as far as uh, overtime and ties go let's just let's just put it in the record books is that don't do behind the scenes stuff yeah it always gets weird when you start doing that uh the other series UMD you could officially say earned a sweep uh, again, it's one of those things where I think officially it'll still go down as a tie because it's a non-conference series. Uh, UMD won game one in overtime and won game two in regulation. A little bit of a surprise there seeing Arizona come uh, t- have a, a lead for most of, I think, game one. Um, they. It was kind of back and forth. They... I took a bunch of a bunch of notes on this. Um, and there was a funny start to the game. It was the new rule where they're really being sticklers on the, the time that you have to spend on the ice before the game and when you have to get off. And so there were a few players from both teams that were just kind of hanging around like players do getting a couple last shots in and then taking their time to go back on the, or back into the locker room. Well, the refs had to call it. And so each team got a bench minor for delay a game. So it started the season four on four. <laughs> they said on Sunday, uh, guys were hustling off the ice and they were off with about 30 seconds to spare. And, and the linesmen started applauding them when they were getting off the ice. So that was kind of a, a unique start to the season. Um, but overall, I, I took more notes on game one than I did game two. Game two, I just was like, I'm going to watch. And I've been up since 7 a.m. Uh, at this point, I, I just want to watch sports. Yeah, as uh, Tugas in our chat points out, you know, got to be the last guy off the ice. That constantly happens and you, and you see it. I think this rule is, it, to me, this rule is kind of dumb, though. If you think about how many pre-game yeah. activities happen, um, nev- no game starts on time. Let's just be real about that. So now we're penalizing guys for essentially nothing when most of these schools have some kind of, oh, here, let's do a ceremonial puck drop. Or it's celebrate the 85 championship team. So let's bring them all on the ice and make sure that they're all there before we sing the national anthem. And we'll just waste 10 minutes at the start of the game. But God forbid, guys are 30 seconds late getting off the ice. Let's penalize them now and and start games four on four. 
it, it's a, it's silly. It's a silly rule. It's a silly silly penalty that we, we're now having to make people accountable for. When half the time, I don't know that refs are really paying attention to shit that's going on during the gameplay. And I I think what they need to do, as they've always done, as soon as the Zamboni comes on the ice, the players get off because they don't want to end up like dead in the original Deadpool crawling across the ice while he chases them with the Zamboni. They're going to move. Just say at this time, the Zamboni's coming on the ice. Let the Zamboni get on the ice. The guys are going to leave. And when the they're doing their first pass around the boards, they better get off. They can't play rock, paper, scissors like you see in the NHL. They're going to get run over. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I don't know. It's just, a, I think this is, we're creating dumb rules now. And this isn't the only uh, pre-game rule change that we've seen. Uh, there's also the one where, you know, before warm-ups even take place, if you're, you can't go on the ice at all before your designated warm-up time. Um, sp- spawning from a North Dakota player trying to turn around or dislodge or in some way maneuver the net at Western Michigan when Western guys were shooting the, into the, the opponent net from across the ice before even really being dressed uh, and doing pre-warm-up warm-up stuff. Again, another silly rule that it just it makes more questions than it answers. Like, um, it, It's silly. It's stupid. It, it doesn't promote or enhance the game in any way, shape, or form. No, it doesn't. And it, if anything, it takes away from it because they're doing that well then get your revenge on the ice that's going to create more animosity amongst the teams and that's going to be a better product for the fans now of course it can get to a level where the animosity goes and kids get hurt and people get hurt which we don't want but if it's a good clean game and you get some chippiness and whatever that's what you want that's what the fans want you want to hate the other team and it, it just yeah it just takes away from it yeah and, and i don't know that they even did any kind of explanation because I, I don't think you kind of alluded to it when we were texting each other during games like i don't understand why it's four on four to start a game so like yeah. they're doing a piss poor job of explaining these new rules or penalties when they happen um you know they're they're clearly affecting games, and this might be one that's easily remedied. And guys, it maybe this is the only time it's called all year, but it's it's still just a stupid addition to to a game that that already has officiating issues, uh, mm-hmm. and just asks them to do too much. And yeah, it didn't help that even the there was another penalty early on in the game that they just go, oh, well, uh, Arizona State's on the power play. And our announcers, they... Not the greatest. I'm yeah, not going to no. lie. They're not they, the greatest. They're, they're not very good. I had to look it up on the NCHC website and tweet to them. And they still never said it, but I tweeted at them. I'm like, just so you guys know, that penalty was for hooking because you never said what the penalty was for. Even though in the little broadcasting I've done, you take one of you two, probably the, co- the, the color commentary guy, you take your head, headphone off and you listen for the call. Yeah. <laughs> or at least look down at the ref. If you're doing hockey and our color commentator played, look down at the ref. You know what the calls are called. Like, you know, the hand motions. Yeah. Figure uh, it out. It was just, it was just, that game had some silliness all over it. But, I mean, I think we are seeing that Arizona State is becoming a, a, a more competitive program. Um, both games were close. And, and we'll kind of jump into them a little bit more here. But I want to get through the exhibition games or at least the series that we don't necessarily care too much about. Yeah. Um, North Dakota did North Dakota things. And they won 5-1 over Manitoba. I, one, I'm glad that this this game got was played as scheduled, and there there were no more hiccups after canceling their a couple of their events earlier in the week due to some illness amongst the team. Uh, looks like they got that figured out. Yep. Not really surprised hearing the result. Um, the next one is actually quite surprising, honestly. 
Omaha came out and won seven to two over Minnesota State. Uh, once again, an exhibition game. So, I mean, you can say that it does or doesn't matter. Um, it's leaning towards it matters a little bit. I think Mankato actually had took a, a slight hit in the rankings. And you can say that, you know, they would have fallen that way if they hadn't played at all. But I think some people are counting this a little bit uh, as to what they thought of the Mankato team. I, I think so, too. And, yeah, you can... It... We were talking about this just before the show. It it matters some, but at the same time, it does it really. It's kind of tough to tell. We don't know what Mankato was doing, how many young guys, new guys they were playing to try and get them into the system, and if Omaha was playing their top guys against them. But either way, for a team like Mankato that just lost in the national championship game, to lose seven to two to an Omaha team that, you know, they, they haven't made the tournament. And since I don't know when it, that's not a good look seven to two, five, four. Okay. Five, three, whatever, four, three, seven to two is just a God awful score. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, like I said, we don't we don't learn a lot, but I think there are some people who are taking this into account. We did see, like I said, we did see Mankato. I think fall a couple spots in in the rankings, and that the rankings mean much, especially this early. But something to kind of pay attention to as the year goes on, you know, is this going to be? If nothing else, I think it gives Omaha a little bit of um, confidence and momentum going into regular season play. Uh, they competed with a team who was in the national championship game last year. Uh, they they outplayed them, they outscored them. Um, you know, you, you take that result for for what it is, and and chuck it up on the board and say, okay, here's what we can do. Let's go and and try and replicate this week in and week out and see what happens. Yeah, I think that's a huge confidence booster. I thought it was going to be a little bit of a confidence killer. I completely missed on that. Uh, let's go to the other side of that national title matchup from last year. Denver did Denver things absolutely yeah. <laughs> dog walking university of nevada las vegas who are trying to uh move up to the division one rankings and well they got a big hey hello how do you do maybe next year sally um <laughs> just yeah absolute beat down it it's reminiscent of what saint thomas experienced last year in their first their first division one game uh just an absolute slaughter at least they only had to do it once yeah exactly <laughs> they're like okay well we'll we'll move on uh, we'll go to the casinos back home <laughs> speaking of saint thomas the scores were a little bit closer but the result was the same it was a saint cloud sweep uh, i think we both predicted that to be the case i believe the first game was a little bit closer um sunday's game was four zero yeah, Saturday's was 3-1. Yeah, so there's some improvement there. Um, again, you know, I mean, you're asking these brand new programs to step into arenas and play teams that are competing for national titles year in and year out who are constantly top 10 teams. It's they're they're not going to be easy games. And I and I think there there's something to be said for just manning up and and being in those games too and playing your, your heart out, even though you, you kind of go into it thinking maybe this isn't a game we can win, but, but showing up and playing uh, speak a lot and they help to build a program too. Yeah. And I don't know if, if um, I, I didn't see any of it. So I don't know if St. Cloud completely outplayed them and they got a lucky one and their goalie played phenomenal or St. Cloud was just, going through their system, getting guys acclimated to how they play, who knows how that series went, but they were talking about it on the radio today, how this is year two of St. Thomas. It's a buildup. They got closer and then they're trying to get a new arena, which if they're more competitive this year, that's going to help them. Cause right now they're playing in basically a small high school arena of 1200 people. And they're trying to build a five to 6,000 seat arena on campus or near campus. Um, 
so this helps them especially and playing st cloud to start a year these last two years that helps because last year they got their rude awakening and this year it's okay we're closer this is what we need to build and yeah they play mankato in their conference schedule but the rest of the ccha isn't that stellar uh so to play some of these more top tier teams that's going to help build the program too. say hey this is our non-conference we go in there we do pretty well we clean up in the conference schedule then it's us and mankato one two because it's going to be really tough to to dethrone mankato once they get get rolling yeah, and I didn't get or I didn't watch any of the Saturday night game. Um, one, I was at work during the Western Michigan football game, and two, it was at St. Thomas, so it wasn't on NCHC TV. I did watch the Saturday game, and I mean St. Cloud seemed to have that game pretty well in hand. Dominic Bassey, you know, the transfer from Colorado College, played extremely well. He earned a shutout. Uh, it's kind of you know what you're hoping for best case scenario there um but it but it was competitive at the same time i think it was kind of late that st cloud really kind of started putting the puck in the net a little bit more um and i'm trying to look at notes from from which game i was talking about but those are the other ones uh but again like i mean it, it was a result that we kind of expected too so it not super surprising um, but I, again, we're, there's some improvement there to be seen for sure from St. Thomas. And I think they're going to get better as the years goes on and, and they get better and better players and become more of a, a recognized name within Minnesota hockey. And I think that's, it's a good and bad thing, but that we're going to get the St. Paul team and the Minneapolis team with the university of Minnesota. And there's going to be that rivalry that, I think will eventually develop as St. Thomas gets better and they'll start scheduling each other because that's going to get the cross town rivals and the public school versus the private school going on. And I believe the last game besides the Western Alaska series and really getting into the UMD series is Colorado college won their game against the air force on Saturday, yes, I want to say it was five one. It was five one. Kind of a surprising result, uh, a little bit. Um, it definitely shows that Colorado College has made some improvement. Uh, I I didn't see the game; I just saw the result. Uh, again, I believe this one was at Air Force, so not on NCHC TV. Um, I don't even know who started for their in their goaltending. But let's check real yeah, quick. I was going to say, I can find out for you. I've searched the, all these hockey teams so much that all I have to do is start typing. It's like, oh, you want this one? Yes, I do. That's exactly what I wanted. Uh, I need... They might even have played both goalies. Let's see. Oh, da, 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 da. I want, I want goalkeeping. Uh... Yeah, they played Matt Vernon and then Caden Bereko. So that was uh, uh, so yeah they they split time. It's about like, yeah. I mean it's pretty much right at thirty thirty. Yeah. Uh, Matt Vernon allowed the goal. Caden came in in relief and earned the win. And he was that player that played for Team <laughs> USA in the in the juniors. So I mean. Definitely good to to get let him get a look early in a game that doesn't count, but still allows guys to build confidence. Um, kind of like we we were talking about earlier, you know these these games don't necessarily count in the record book, but they count for the guys who played them, and it, and they count in the coaches' eyes as an opportunity to uh, examine players and see exactly what they got. Maybe mix up lines a little bit, you know, give uh, a team. Or give some guys an opportunity that they may not get during normal course of play, you know, play both goalies, mm-hmm. um, things like that. So, impre- and, but still an impressive win in my opinion. Yeah, it still is an impressive win. Uh, we thought it was going to be a lot closer game than five to one. So good for Colorado College, and same thing with Omaha. That might give them a little bit of a little bit of a confidence boost. 
And then we'll go to uh, your series, Miami. Nope, you are Minnesota Duluth. And you guys played, I don't remember who now. Arizona State. Arizona State. We just talked about it briefly. <laughs> but I'll let you take the lead on this one. Tell me tell me uh, about your games. Uh, game one looked very discombobulated. Uh, other than Olsen, James, and Beyond line they looked very solid. And Tanner Laderoot, he was playing like a captain should. He was flying all over the ice. Uh, Arizona State, after the four-on-four, four, uh, Arizona State scored on a power play goal in front of Stayskull, who played the whole game. And it was just uh, a scramble for the puck. There, there was nothing he could do about it. The defense weren't clearing anything, anybody out. Um, second period... The freshmen, you could just tell they were still freshmen getting used to the system and the NC or well and the NCAA play because this isn't even NCHC. But the defense, especially being a little bit older, they looked really good. They had a lot of aft, active sticks. They were breaking up plays. They weren't making too many mistakes to let Arizona State have free chances. Um, it's kind of funny. One of the notes that I had that I'll get to for the second game is Steve's one of the freshmen. He didn't quite look like he knew how to play within a system. He looked like he was the guy he's going to show boat. He's going to score all the goals. Screw the system. This is how I play. This is how I'm going to go. That changed a little bit. Um, but Dominic James ended up, tying the goal or tying the game one, one after a nice cross ice pass from Olsen. And that was that line just clicking like they did last year. Uh, Isaac Howard, a freshman scored on the power play. And then in overtime, Dashke, the transfer from Miami that we were talking about uh, last week or two weeks ago, uh, he just ripped a shot near side in overtime, right past the goalies here. And it was beautiful. And it, it it was a beautiful shot, beautiful play. And I'm really happy he got that one out of the way just because it shows his leadership, his calmness. And hey, I can score a little bit too other than playing great defense. Uh, game two, that one, that one felt a little bit more in hand. Now, like I said, I didn't see the first period because I was messing with my NCHC TV and trying to get everything uh, figured out, but Arizona state scored just two seventeen in, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name uh, because it is a sweet looking name, but I don't know what that, how to pronounce it. Uh, but then six minutes into the set. Well, actually it was two minutes into the second, six minutes into the second Luke Malimok, he scored from Laderoot and Cole Spicer, who is also another freshman. And then Ben Steves, who I was just talking about, he scored just two pretty, pretty goals. Uh, and I, I, I'm hoping that he gets, gets more assists. One was a power play goal. One was just a really, I don't know how he scored it. Uh, but I'm hoping he gets more into the the system of the team and passes the puck a little bit more because he's proven he has the skills to score and take over a game when he needs to. But if he's that dangerous, he should be able to set up his teammates and his line mates. Uh, and then Owen Gallatin scored in a third, uh, making it 4-1. And uh, as far as goalies go, we split... Um, you split the weekend. Uh, Stay yeah, Skull played the game weekend. one. And then Thiesen played game two. And my takeaway from that is from the two games is it's Stay Skull's net to lose still. I think they might go with the split for a while. But the two goals Stay Skull gave up, 
they, they were just clusters and I didn't see the goal Thiessen gave up, but they seemed to play better defensively in front of in front of him because they had one game under their belt, but he just didn't look as solid. He looked like he was flailing a little bit more and just a little bit off. And I, that might be my bias just because I like Stayskull as a goalie. I want him to do well, but that was also just the eye test. Um, I'll have to maybe two weeks from now, I'll have to have my brother watch with me and see what he thinks for both games since he's the goalie. Yeah. I mean, I, I watched most of game two. Um, I was trying to catch up on the Friday games that I had missed or the Saturday games that I had missed uh, and I ended up watching kind of both the end or the end of both the St. Cloud game and the Duluth game uh, before taking a nap before the Western games. Cause they were both super late this weekend being mm-hmm. out in Alaska. Um, yeah, I thought I thought both teams played extremely well. I, again, I think we kind of figured, I for one figured that if it, if there was going to be a sweep, it was going to be Duluth. It kind of came down to who got the jump first on the Friday game. I, f- I figured the Friday game might have been the game to lose for Duluth, but they they and it kind of was. Uh, they just happened to pull it out in overtime, and then carried that to Saturday. And it, that was kind of enough of a wake up call for the more experienced guys. Like, okay, like the season's here. We need to actually play the way we want to play. Uh, we can't be outplayed by by anybody, especially still kind of a new program. Um, was it game one or game two where Doan absolutely lit somebody up? I think it was game two. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it was game two. Uh, game two got a lot chippier than game one, and you could see it towards the end of game one, but game two, they were just starting to hit and. That might have been the, the charging State. call that we were both kind of iffy on. Yeah, I think, yeah, it was because it was a clean hit. It just, it was one of those, the refs were like, oh, it's a hard hit. I had, to, penalty. I, I had to go back and watch it. And he's literally at a standstill, takes two steps to get back up to some semblance of speed, turns around and hip checks the player. Like, I don't. I get that, like, t- if you're taking more than two steps, it's supposed to be charging. But he was coasting into the hit with his back to him. He wasn't sk- power skating backwards or anything like that. It wasn't an egregious. It, he didn't come from across the ice. He literally came from like ten feet away and just yeah, potatoed was, the guy into the boards. It was one of those where I think the ref saw he was getting he was getting checked. But it was so fast, like he got checked and then flattened. Yeah, that there was nothing Doan could do. It, he was already committed to the hit at the time that it it, it was like in football when guys get sandwiched. It yeah. there's nothing you can do, and the refs just saw oh big hit. I don't know. It it, that that's one you let the players decide. I don't think it was a penalty at all. A little bit of a soft but, call there, but you know it's early in the year. We're gonna get more of those. Earlier in the yeah. year than we will later in the year. But um, I do think um, that, like you were saying, it was a wake-up call. I think it was more of a wake-up call for the younger guys than it was the older guys. The guys that have had at least one year of experience, the, I mean, they're veterans now of the, of the NCAA. They know what it takes. They know how hard it is to win in the conference and just in college hockey. So they probably woke the freshman up and had a conversation after that Saturday game into the Sunday game. And that transferred over. And it was probably a lot harsher conversation than people might think just because they're college kids and the older guys probably laid into them quite a bit because they're freshmen. (laughs) Yeah, probably. Uh, Speaking of wake up calls, I guess you could say, uh, Western got a little bit of a wake-up call Saturday. They fell to Alaska Anchorage by a score of 3-1. to one. Uh, I've, I've heard differing things. There were some that said the ice was kind of uh, a little mushy. It wasn't the, the best skating surface. Uh, you might take into account you know, the fact that they got there, I think, Thursday night, uh, Friday morning. A uh, little bit of a late turnaround as far as you know, adjusting to a different time zone that far away. 
Um, I mean, these things may have came in, come into play, but when you look at really kind of the, the style of play that took place, I don't, I don't know that that's accurate. I think it, it really just came down to Alaska taking better advantage of their opportunities. Uh, they had, you know, Western did a really good job of possessing the puck, limiting shots. I think they had less than 15 shots in either game. Uh, a couple a couple misplays on the western end uh, a power play goal gave them gave Alaska the lead early in the second or in the second period on Saturday Friday, what Sunday nope Saturday I know how games are this stupid schedule is I, I know me, I hate it too it's screwing me up um but they they're on the power I think they were just finished a power play we take a penalty in the offensive zone the, the worst place to take a penalty is when you're in your offensive zone it, it it kills everything you're doing. Uh, it hurts the goalie because now he has to deal with a faceoff in his zone. Uh, then, so not only do we give up or take a penalty there, on the same play after Alaska gets the puck in our zone, we take another one. So it's five on three for a full two. Uh, the, the, you know, Alaska takes the opportunity and, and they score. Uh, so third period where they're up 2-1 in the third period, they get a... Insurance goal to make it 3-1. That ends up being the final score. It looked like a lot of pucks were just coming off of sticks weird. Uh, And, I mean, Alaska ate a lot of shots. I think they had 22 block shots on Friday night. So guys were getting getting in the way of things. But at the same time, we weren't getting the cleanest shots off either. Um, Pucks were going wide. Pucks were going directly into teammates, opposing players. Kind of, it almost looked like anywhere but where where they were meant to be going. Um, well, and I think that that even plays into the this discussion that we had about. I think it was the five on three, or first of all, two penalties on one play. You already know you're going shorthanded. That was dumb, but I thought your goalie should have had it. And I don't even remember who was playing. I was just watching the game. I was halfway paying attention to names. Uh, Cameron Rowe started Friday night, the transfer from Wisconsin. Okay. So I thought Rowe should have had it, but after seeing more of it and how pucks were coming off, you, you thought it fluttered a bit. It could have been uh, the ice and maybe on a decent sheet of ice. He has it. I don't know. I wasn't there. It was a YouTube broadcast, still better than the 1983 cameras that we're using for our broadcast. Well, we can but, get we can get into that uh, at the end of the show because that needs to be discussed at some point. Yeah, it does. But uh, that definitely could have played into it because you guys are missing shots and pucks are bouncing weird. Well, maybe he thought it was going one place, and all of a sudden the puck ends up somewhere else. Yeah, and Western's lone goal of game one came on the power. Uh, I believe it. Yep, power play. Uh, Jamie Rome is the goal scorer there. Uh, I think the biggest takeaways, at least for me, Friday night, uh, as I mentioned this on Twitter, I was having a conversation with somebody else. Was Saturday. That Saturday. God bless America. I'm going <laughs> to do it every time, too. It's just Saturday. Friday means Saturday. Saturday means Sunday. And if I happen to say Saturday and mean it, well, then good luck trying to figure out which one I'm meaning. Either way. This is why I have this. Actually, you know what? It might have been Sunday morning at that time because the game freaking started at ten o'clock Eastern time. I think that did. Yeah, I, I, I think that did have a little bit to do with it, and 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 there's no way it couldn't have. You know, your guys are playing later than they're used to playing on that internal clock. Uh, you can. I had this kind of on my honeymoon. I went to San Diego, so the whole time, like my body was three hours ahead of whatever we were. So I was waking up at like seven, eight o'clock California time, but that's 10, 11 o'clock Michigan time. And I'm like, Oh, Hey, this is great. I'm freaking up early, but now I'm up super late too. Cause I'm used to being up later Michigan time. So my whole body was out of whack. And I, and I assume some of that happened to these guys too. Sunday was a little bit earlier. Um, but yeah, an hour earlier. Yeah. But the thing, the point I was going to get to is that like, this is not the same team that we had last year. You know, we're missing a lot of, our offense because a lot of the guys who scored our goals last year were upperclassmen. Younger guys have to step up. Everything's going to look a little bit different. We don't have a 
a line of guys who've been together for four years, three, four years playing together. Um, guys are learning where their new teammates are, how they play together. We have essentially half of our team is brand new, whether it's freshmen or transfer students. And yeah, they might have played together in the juniors, but first Weiler mentioned it today in his press conference, like, you know, we're breaking habits of other teams and installing Bronco habits. Um, we're playing, getting used to new teammates and, and new plays, and the power play is going to look different. We don't have station shooters on the power play like we used to. They have to work the puck a little bit more. And we saw that in the first, I think it was the first goal on Saturday, Sunday. First goal on Sunday, where Poland was kind of camped out uh, on the post, as opposed to you know a shot coming from the, the left face-off circle where it was coming from with... Ethan or the right face off circle right side of the goalie it's a uh, left face off circle left face off circle if you're at center ice behind the player whatever it was um where Ethan Frank and Ronnie Adder would camp out on power plays so the power play has a different look it was still effective I mean they got we got two power play goals on the weekend um Saturday Almquist also had a power play goal for Alaska former UMD Bulldog. Yep. But uh, we, we kind of saw a little bit of that old Western hockey where we grind and, and play this style of hockey we want to play and, and, and teams kind of tire out because Western really kind of took over in the third period of, of game two. And we had three goals in just over six minutes or just under six minutes. Went from Larkin was the second goal. I think that ended ended up being the game-winning goal. It was our first even-strength goal of the year. Uh, Washi came back about four minutes later and scored the third goal of the game and then went, gave up the puck to Larkin this time for him to bury the fourth goal uh, roughly six minutes after Went scored his. So there is some offense there that, that can be had. Again, I think we're just starting to see this team begin to gel and make uh, team plays because you can practice with guys all day and everything kind of changes when you hit game speed. There's a difference between practice speed and game speed. And if you haven't played a sport, that may seem odd to you, but it's it's 100% the reality of the situation and, and being used to guys and understanding where they are as opposed to where they're not. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest takeaway. Like, you see it in every sport. Well, maybe not baseball as much, but the first week, the first few games, NFL week one, there's always that overreaction. And I'm trying not – that's why I said some of the comments that I did where it's like it should get better. They need to work to get into the system. These are brand-new teams. It's not like, you know – you see it some in professional sports, like some more than others, but in college sports, there is turnover every year. And there's usually a decent amount of turnover because you're going to have your group of seniors that have left and grad students that have left your juniors moving up sophomores, whatever. And then your incoming freshmen that are going to, it's going to take them time to adjust. It's just a matter of, how well can you coach them when you start training camp? And then are they the right guys that you brought in for your style of play? And if you don't have that, if you don't have the right type of guys, and if you don't have the coaching staff, it's just not going to, and you don't have the leadership on the team, it's just not going to work. And that's why teams like Denver, North Dakota, um, Western's getting there, but UMD, well western last year having that leadership that's where those things come into play and so now you guys have have some leadership that has had success that can teach these younger guys and the new transfers exactly what to what to do because you you don't have um you know dashkey he doesn't need to be taught what needs to be done for umd he's played four years in the nchc yeah. he knows um but the freshman coming in that's it, it's tough to not overreact to what you see, but you have to temper it down and say, okay, it's one week. 
you know, the rankings are going to do whatever they do, but this is not who the team is going to be two months from now because they're going to have that non-conference schedule under like in their bag. They're going to know what needs to be done and then conference play hits. And that's going to be where you should know the identity of your team and how you're going to be able to play and stack up in the conference. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I, I fully agree. I think like the, the first few weeks, you know, it's, can we see improvement throughout the players? And I think we even saw some improvement over the weekend uh, between the two games. The the one spot that I don't know that we got any kind of clear information from is goaltending. Um, yeah, you can say, you know, one goalie played better than the other. Both goalies really had limited work. I think that speaks volumes for what we're able to do with the players in front of the goalie. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, the go- one goalie did play better than the other if you're looking at just the scores. But at the same time, you know, there were a lot more mistakes or a few more mistakes made in the first game that kind of got cleaned up a little bit by the second game. Um, both goalies did play. Each got a game. I think that was always going to be the plan going into the weekend, whether Western had won Friday or not. Saturday, damn it. Um or not. Both both played pretty well. There there's definitely some improvement to be made by both and and hopefully we'll see that as the season goes on. Good news is the guys get a little bit extra rest this week. They have one game on Saturday. Uh it's a quick trip up to Ferris. About an hour and a half, maybe two hour bus ride. Um but First, why I mentioned this too, like that could be an interesting series too, because Ferris will play game uh, on Friday night against Michigan Tech, so they'll have a game early, but they might have, you know, they'll have warmer legs going into Friday, where Western's getting this long break. They're adjusting back to their normal time zone. It, it's a and based on how Miami or Ferris and Miami played. I think it could it's a winnable game for Western for sure. Um it'll come down to like I said once again just how much do they allow the other team to stick with them? Uh and in every aspect, you know, how many penalties are they taking? Are they taking bad penalties? Are they taking okay penalties to take? Are they giving up shots from terrible angles that you know goalie can see coming and or are they giving up angles in, in deadly spots like straight up the middle in the slot? Like things like that only don't help your goalie, and especially when you've got two kind of inexperienced goalies. Um, Cameron Rowe getting minimal work with Wisconsin, and Kirk Larson not playing at all last year. The more that you can do to help those guys, the better our season's going to go, and. Honestly, I think our offense played well. It's just a matter of potentially trying to get the shot off that you want to take and and hope that it's going in the right direction and not having pucks bounce weirdly off of our sticks. Yeah, and I I think I think we're doing the same thing, giving guys equal opportunity uh and you know, you said it best with we saw improvement both Western and UMD from game one to game two on the defensive side. So, and I'm going back a little bit, but the stats wise for us, Stayskull gave up two. Thiesen gave up one. Okay. But you have to look at how Stayskull gave up his two, how Thiesen gave up his one, um, how the team played in front of them, where the shots went, how did they look for the eye test, everything. And that's from what I can tell, those are going to be our two biggest question marks are the goalies for, for both of our teams. Um, So we'll see, but you guys don't get as much rest as we do because we have next weekend off. Hey, there you go. Look at you guys. So it's perfect time for me to go fishing because Hey, I don't have UMD to watch. While we're on the fact that UMD gets the week off next week, you think maybe, just maybe, you guys could uh, upgrade those cameras in Amsoil Arena? 
No. While you guys are off, because those things were awful. They they're terrible. It was as if somebody had motion blur to a hundred and fifty percent in a video game. You know, my I literally my... got sick to my stomach watching a couple of the extended plays. Like the back and forth play of that game. It it's like when to me watching those cameras, it's like the first time I went from watching HD TV back to my parents' house deer hunting or whatever I was doing and turning on the TV and it's standard def and it just looked awful. This is the internet. Like, this should be high quality. These things look like they used to film the Vietnam War. I mean, good God. See, Walter Cronkite probably had better cameras than this. Their inability to zoom or to pick a zoom was atrocious as well. I like the in-between periods where they just kept, like, figuring out the zoom yeah. on the... <laughs> one spot on the boards. I'm I'm honestly surprised the game was in freaking color with how bad these cameras were. They were just bad. It was awful. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that Western has the greatest cameras either. But our stadiums or our ice arena is not really set up to be like recorded. It's meant to be experienced. Is the yeah. nice way of saying it. We we have this brand new arena. Well, that's why we can't afford the cameras because we got the brand new arena. Well, but, brand new as of but, freaking 2007 or whatever, 2008. Bro, you need to like call up, you know, one of these old time hockey players that came through, you know, Brett Hall. like Brett Hall and be like, hey, you want to donate some money for some better cameras so people can actually see what the hell is going on during one of our games if they're not here? That I mean, cool. I. I could find Niskanen o- over the summer, but you know, or maybe, maybe yeah, I've, I, I've I've heard he uh, maybe Perunovic while he's healing from his sh- shoulder surgery. God, I maybe, feel maybe, so maybe, bad for him. Even I do though too. I think, but maybe he like, can come and help out. Like just something. Like y'all cameras are bad, bro. I don't think he'd remember the, me, but I, I'll, I'll I'll talk to his old high school tennis coach. Hey, hey, Gary, get me in contact with Scotty. The freaking. San Jose Sharks have better cameras than Minnesota Duluth, and San Jose has like the worst TV experience for NHL. The I'm Arizona, sure. the Arizona Coyotes are probably going to have a better camera setup, and they're playing at Arizona State's Ice Arena for the next like three years. I'm pretty sure our community access uh, television for our high school games had better cameras. It was so bad. The amount of how it, bad it was cannot be understated, overstated. And then the and then the the commentary. I'm sorry. There was they, nothing enjoyable about y'all's broadcast. The, no, the, the camera sucked. And I have to deal with it every fucking game. The commentators sucked, and it's probably that same dude who was like, "Oh, two minutes left in the game. Yeah, just check somebody, take a penalty." Yeah, it was fine. I, I'm pretty sure. Sh- no. Mm. That might have been the uh, North Dakota guys for Midco or whatever. No, I'm pretty sure that was a Minnesota. Oh, that was well, a, maybe it was the game. guys. That was one of the two. I'm pretty sure it was that bald dude. I'm like 95% sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. He was the one who played. Well, he also said... Um, I teach my... I coach my kids to take penalties when there's less than two minutes left. Just check someone in the back. He was also the one that said... Uh, the hardest thing to do in college hockey is score goals. I'm pretty sure that's one of like the hardest thing to do in all of hockey, no matter what. Like, I mean, maybe mites, but like it. Like, right. thanks, Sherlock. Thanks, John Madden. You know the team that scores <laughs> the most points today. They're they're probably going to win the game. You don't God. say. All right, let's look ahead to this weekend. Uh, yes, let's. Otherwise, I'm gonna get way too fired up. Holy Cross playing at North Dakota should be a pretty easy weekend for the Fighting Hawks. Yeah, North Dakota, uh, they swept Holy... I think they played Holy Cross. Or, no, they played Niagara last year. Um, But it should be still a fairly easy weekend for North Dakota. Speaking 
I think a sweep for them. Yeah, that probably feels about right. Um, and we are going to start keeping track of our predictions. Yeah, I should actually do we, that we right did, now. We did. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I will keep track of mine myself. You can keep track of your own. And I don't know. This is going. something that we discussed this week. Uh, uh, we both have UND back. with a sweep. Okay. Speaking of Niagara, who played North Dakota last year, they will be traveling to Omaha. Omaha coming off of a big win. In the exhibition round, Niagara is a team that generally struggles, but Omaha can be inconsistent. Do they play two games? Um, I'm just looking at the NCHC uh, schedule now. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. I'm going to say that's a split. I think Niagara will come in and win game one. And I think Omaha will respond yeah. and win and pick up the the win Saturday. Um, I'm not going to lock those types of picks in, but I will go with the split for UNO. I 100% agree with you. Omaha, um, and even with the Friday-Saturday, I think Omaha is going to come in riding super high off of their exhibition game against Mankato, which... You know, again, we don't know all the details, but it's a confidence booster, and they might go, oh, well, we we just piss-pounded Mankato. We should beat Niagara, and then all of a sudden Niagara comes out and steals the first game. Uh, I, I think it, that's a split, too. Just based on Omaha's history and based off of beating a team like Mankato, that can induce overconfidence. Yeah, I think they're going to ride that high for a little bit, even though, like, like we said, it was just an exhibition game. Um, but I think they, I think they they get a little too too big for their britches. But they did have a pretty good go of it last year in the non conference schedule. You know, we saw a team that I think they got to like eight and zero or something to start last year, um, and a lot of that was due to the fact that they were at home for a lot of their non-conference games they didn't have the toughest non-conference schedule and and we saw that again this year when we did this uh breakdown there at home they don't have the toughest non-conference schedule so they should jump out to a fairly decent record and then you're on your own after that yeah so yeah i'm gonna stick with the split there um yep i'm gonna go with the split too that that's exactly what i was thinking Miami is on the road at UMass Lowell Friday and Saturday. UMass was a team. Lowell was a a solid team last year. Um, And Miami's had its ups and downs. They're coming off of a a pseudo split with Ferris. Um, I think a split seems likely here. Miami's so inconsistent. I don't know that they necessarily brought in a lot of big-time made a lot of big time moves. I don't know that they really have a lot of guys coming back that I have a lot of confidence in a couple that I do, you know, red Savage. He mm-hmm. played extremely well this weekend as, as you kind of predicted. He, or we, we predicted he would. Um, but UMass slow is a big, I feel like they're a big kind of step up from Ferris. As far as competition goes, I think Ferris was definitely a, a little bit more competitive and on a similar plane to what Miami has been lately. I don't know if I would say a considerable step up, but I, I think it is a step up, maybe a half step up, um, just because of how Lowell has fared the last few years. They haven't been... Um, a few years ago, they were up towards the top, but they're kind of lower middle to lower middle pack uh, in their conference. Um, I, I go Miami I, split... But I lean a UMass sweep, um, partly because they're on uh, UMass Lowell is on home ice. Um, I think that that does tend to be a little bit of an advantage. I'm I'm gonna go a Lowell sweep. That's that's what I think. I just think Miami's still trying to figure themselves out. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll go split Miami. 
I think they, I think they're a little bit better than they were last year, but I think they're still just super inconsistent. Uh, Western only plays one game at Ferris. Based on what I've seen, both of Ferris pl- having played Miami last week and Western Michigan, it's going to be a competitive game. It always is. Uh, how much, how well can Western improve on what they did this last weekend? Um, how tired are they going to, can they capitalize on the fact that they're not playing Friday night? We've had Ferris's number the last few years, but we have goal, new goalie. So how much can skaters protect the goalie? Um, I'm still going to lean Western just because Western's my team and I'm, I'm nine times out of 10, I'm probably going to lean them, especially against a team like Ferris who we've, I think swept the last two straight years, two or three years. Um, yeah, I'll, th- I'll take Western in that game. I'm just because of, and yes, I know it was the first game of the year, but just because of how Western came out against Alaska Anchorage, I'm a little iffy on them. I think Western gets the win, but it's an overtime or a shootout. I I don't think they win in regulation. Just just because you can make the adjustments in between game one and two, which I see all the time with UMD, I think uh, I think Western squeaks them out, but it's going to be a really close game, and it's going to be an overtime or a shootout. So that'll be the tiebreaker for that one. I want to say that I think the loss to Alaska kind of woke them up a little bit. Um, I think they went into that game a little overconfident. I think a lot of people are going to go into Alaska a little bit overconfident, whereas Alaska doesn't really have anything to lose. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're just really kind of playing to show up and show out and hope that they can continue to bring in funding so they can keep their program going. Um, so, so it's kind of a trap game, and, and we fell for the trap. But again, I don't think Western really played terribly. We just didn't play a clean game that we needed to play. Like Shots weren't clean enough. We took stupid penalties. Uh, I think we'll see a different team, and, and that experience I think will wake some of the newer guys up to to what college hockey is, and we'll get better as the season goes on, and we those fourteen players get more into what Bronco hockey is. But and it, but I think I think we'll see a win against Ferris for sure. And we we didn't mention this, but one thing with the the Anchorage broadcast because it was on YouTube. They kept talking about how I was a new team. It was an like young team, whatever that they had going on. There were a lot of transfers in, so that Alaska team was not an untalented team. No, we talked about um, Almquist coming from UMD. He played a big part in the team last year. There, there were talented players on that team. It's just they need to gel. So. I think they have a shot at being decent. It's it's not like they're playing a bottom feeder. It's just they haven't had a team for two years. Speaking of Alaska Anchorage, they will be Colorado College's opponent this weekend uh, at Colorado College. That, I will that's say, an interesting one. I mean, Colorado College played well against Air Force. I think Colorado College, I think, is going to have uh, – I don't even know how to know. I don't even know if I can really say that they're going to have a goalie advantage because we did see uh, – is it Lamaru? Yes. Yep, Lamaru. Play for Alaska Anchorage, still wearing his St. Cloud State goalie mask. <laughs> Which was awesome. <laughs> get, get the kid a new mask. For the love of God. Some, somebody, any donor out there, get the kid a new mask. His mask looked as bad as Duluth's cameras. Just awful. Um, That's a all, high bar to clear. All that green and yellow and then just bright red and white goalie mask. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> that doesn't seem right. It was, it was who, almost who like... Who let their oh, little brother on the ice? Well, it was almost like his water broke and he found out he was pregnant. Oh, wait, I'm playing college hockey? Yeah. he was. He looked like the emergency backup goaltender. 
pretty much. Just, just grab whatever mask you have laying around and freaking get to the rink. All right, come on. Um, it's got My Little Pony on it. But they, but Alaska did not look bad. I think this could no honestly be a split. I think it could be a split. Um, and now I haven't seen Colorado College play. I have seen Anchorage play. Um, and obviously haven't seen Air Force play either. So I don't know. I think that Anchorage team is just hungry enough to get one. And and the Colorado like College said, is historically played... bad to give one up. Yeah. And like you said, Lamaru played really, really well. He did. He did until he got hurt. He ended up with like full body cramps and had to be pulled, I think, partway through the third period. Oof. But, I mean, their their goalie that came in in relief uh, played pretty well. He played all the Saturday. Um, he just It just got to a point where the guys who had played together for Western figured it out and, and started putting the puck in the back of the net past him. He didn't really have – there wasn't really much he could do on the goals that he let in. Uh, he, he played as well as he was going to, for sure. And, I mean, I think he saw, like, 30 shots, so it's not like you can really – Say he wasn't tested because he was. He was just hard to hard to beat for for quite a bit, and then the dam broke, and that was the end of it. Um, let's see, I'm I'm typing in my predictions. I'm gonna go with Colorado College. I'm gonna go with a split, and CC gets the win on on Friday because Anchorage is coming into town. And then I'm going to go with Anchorage gets the win on Saturday, just because they'll have made the adjustments where Colorado college is still sitting back and trying to play that home ice and that, that altitude advantage. And I I think uh, Alaska gains from the experience of playing a team like Western. I think the, figured out you know they played well against us for the most part um they got they got kind of bodied a little bit but i I think they they learn from that and they try and either do the same thing to a colorado team or they try and avoid it a little bit more um but that'll be that experience of playing a, a big tough western team i think will be more beneficial to them than had they played a team you know, like a, like a Manitoba or, or a like a Western, or... yeah. Well, Lindenwood maybe not. That might have been a, a pretty yeah. comparable game. Um, Long Island, yeah. I mean, Lindenwood did just get its. Or no, they did not play them. Was that that was last year? Because I'm on the wrong freaking. All right, life. Can you stop screwing with me for a minute, please? Here. No. All right, Denver has a tournament this weekend sort of ish ish yeah icebreaker tournament ish not played in a tournament <laughs> style on friday they will host notre dame so this is going to be fun because we have to make you know double the picks here for freaking du well i think i have my idea and i think it's kind of obvious but You know, I, I think the obvious pick is to lean sweep for DU. However, Notre Dame played extremely well last year. They did not cleanly lose. I don't think they actually lost any game to the University of Michigan last year. I think they won two games in overtime, and they won two games in regulation at the end of the year. So they're a team that can definitely compete. They beat North Dakota in the first round of the NCAA tournament. I believe they lost to Minnesota State. Yes, because we lost to Minnesota. And then Denver and oh, UMish nice. were the other two. If it was Minnesota State, Minnesota, and yeah, Denver. Yeah, and then Denver Mich. beat Michigan. Yeah. So, yeah, they lost to Minnesota State last year in the tournament. 
It's at Denver. We know Denver's super hard to play at home. I just I they they do, they up. they lose uh Brink. Is it Brink? Yeah, Bobby Brink. Yeah. They lose him. They still have Carter Mazer. They still have Magnus. <clears throat> I just I don't see Denver losing. I just don't. Um yeah, but I wonder how much Yeah, well But here's the thing too, is like how much are they do they have a championship hangover, first and foremost? Do they ride that wave and come into this game a little overconfident after what they had done to UNLV? Like, is can this be a trap game playing Notre Dame? Notre Dame's a good team. Like, Notre Dame is is a well, is a good program. They, they just lost to the national development team in an exhibition five to three. Yeah, but so did North Dakota last year, and North Dakota still ended up sharing a piece of the Penrose. So, I mean, I'm just I'm. Maybe maybe that's a wake up call for Notre Dame too. Like, hey, we just got our asses kicked by teenagers. Maybe we should get our shit together and play hockey the way we know how to play. So I mean, like, all of these things are, are pieces to the puzzle that we won't mm-hmm. really see the final picture of until 10 p.m. Friday night. Yeah, and I mean, there is a part of it though. How many guys are left on Notre Dame from the? 2018 national championship runner-up team that lost mm-hmm. to UMD at the XL Energy Center. Very few, they, if any. They would have to be fifth-year seniors at this point. Exactly. So, and they've kind of declined since that. Now, 2020 was 2020 was 2020. Um, and that 2020 2021 season was also kind of messed up. the 21 22 season was more normal and they just didn't i mean they were one of the better teams in the big 10 but that's not saying a whole lot when you only have two or three strong teams and you're just piss pounding everybody else um and i don't know what their record ended up last year or anything i think they're i want to say they were pretty close to 500 honestly but i can look it up real quick but they were good enough to make it to the tournament they did win a tournament game Um, now they're 28 and 12 last year and they also lost to the national development team in the first (laughs) but again like Uh, i said so did north dakota lost to him i think even later in the year i think they might have played the development team over like winter break and lost to him so i mean like that's not necessarily uh, not necessarily something to yeah. Count for or um, against them, honestly. Notre Dame did lose to Niagara, though, on New Year's Day. They they lost 3-1, but then they figured it out on the, on the second one, 5-0. I'm just they have they have That's a true. tendency of appearing in big games. Yeah. And and turning out. Now, I think Denver is going to win. Uh, but I think it's going to be a close game. I think it may be like Four three three two something in in that area. Um, we're still early enough in the season that you know no one's going to really be tired. But how much does that elevation take out of Notre Dame? It's definitely a big advantage for Denver. Uh, but but I do think Denver is going to going to win that game. Yeah, I th- I think it'll be I think it'll be closer than we or than I'm making it out to be. But I think Denver wins that game. Um, and then that moves us to Saturday. Where they play Maine, who I think Maine plays Air Force Friday night. Uh, that would make sense because Air Force is the other team that uh, Notre Dame plays. Yeah. Um, again, how much can Notre Dame really take out of Denver? I think I think the Friday night game is going to be a little bit of the the tougher of the two games, and I could see Denver sweeping the weekend, but winning this one probably a little more comfortably, maybe like four one five two somewhere in that ballpark. 
Yeah, and let's see what Maine did in their first weekend. They have not played yet. And could be oh, they, they they played University of Prince Edward Island in an exhibition. Ooh. And they won one to nothing. Yeah, I'm definitely going to stick with my 4-1-5-2 ballpark of that game. Yeah, but is it brought to you by Moe's Original Barbecue? Ooh. I mean, I wish. It would be I nice. wish. Uh, Actually, as long as they what? deliver. I found this amazing barbecue place today in, in, or not today, this weekend. That is apparently a little bit of a chain, but they were fantastic. I think it's called like City Barbecue or something. So if they want to sponsor us and send us some delicious barbecue, I'd be down for that. If anybody really wants I, to sponsor I, us, look, fucking let us know. We'll, we're down for some shit. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll talk to uh, I got a kid coming Mike, in. Micah's uncle and like, hey, you want to sp- sponsor a podcast? What's it about hockey? Why would I sponsor you? Because I love your barbecue, and I've already promoted you at the state fair and sent like twenty people your way. <laughs> I've got a kid coming. Any any way I can make some extra scratch or get some shit for free, I'm down for right now. Uh, <laughs> this man has kids. <laughs> I've got kids. <laughs> best, best promo ever. Uh, who do, who do we got left? We got Saint Cloud still. Uh, oh yeah. I always forget about them. Are they even playing? I don't. I mean. They no, they aren't. They aren't playing either. What? What is it with these Minnesota schools? You lazy pricks! It's not even open to deer hunting, so I don't know what I don't know what we're doing. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm on the NCHC website right now. Uh, oh, yep. Nope. They play Wisconsin October 14th and 15th. All right. Uh, let's see. Denver, we got Colorado College. We got Western. We got Miami. We got Omaha. Uh, Denver yep. or North Dakota. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. Okay. Six plus two is eight. Yep. Two guys not playing. Cool. Super lazy. Well, we'll see how we do. If we go by last week, I had six right and two wrong. Not bad. But those are also going by like fan results of the two uh, sweep slash split. I don't know how I did. I don't remember what I said. I don't either. I only wrote mine down. I wasn't I just, listening I, enough to you in the, the when I went back and looked through the podcast. I, w- I wasn't listening enough to myself, but I, and uh, I just didn't write it down. But I have it written down now. I did miss on the Western split. They disappoint. Well, yeah, I called it a sweep. They ended up splitting after I looked and thought about it a little bit later. I was like, mm, that's probably going to be a split. I think, uh, and then, I think I called UMD a sweep and by fan vote. It was a sweep. And then uh, UNO was the big surprise. Yes. That one I know I got wrong. (laughs) Yes. So that'll about do it. I believe there's nothing else for me. Uh, If someone happened to stumble in here from Twitch and they want to, feel free to... Follow the channel. We do this every Tuesday night at 9-ish. Sometimes there's technical difficulties and we don't start till 9.30 because we feel like it. Um, if you're on the YouTube channel and you've somehow stumbled upon us and enjoyed what you watched for some reason, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can leave a comment. You can tell us you hate us. That's fine. And whatever. That's fine. You can give us a thumbs up. You can give us a thumbs down. Yeah, you're adults. Uh, there is a Twitch, nope, there is a Twitter handle that is scrolling across the page right now below us. There is an email address that is following said Twitter handle right now at the bottom of the screen scrolling past. Our personal Twitter handles are on there too, so if you feel so inclined as to send us dirty, inappropriate, mean comments to us personally, those are there to do. If you want to say, hey, you guys are learning and doing a great job, you can do that too, whatever. I figure most people tend to lean towards the negatives. I want to spot the negatives first. Um, anything else, Michael? I got nothing. I can't wait for November. November's gonna be fun. It will be a weekend of hockey. A full weekend. It's gonna be glorious. It'll be amazing. All right. Until the next episode. What do we always say, Michael? If you put the puck on the net, good things happen, like goal horns and fight songs. Have a good one. Mm-hmm.